Victory Christian Fellowship is one of the area's dynamic churches touching the lives of hundreds of people in Adamsville and the surrounding communities in the world. We're a church full of energy, faith, and most importantly, people who want to serve Jesus and one another. At Victory Christian Fellowship, we're focused on changing families that change the world by teaching people how to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Showing them from the word of God that they are champions, that God created them for greatness, and that God has a destiny for them to fulfill. VCF is a multiracial church that demonstrates God's love to all. Newcomers are extended a most cordial invitation to worship and unite with us. We're located at 2440 Minor Parkway in Adamsville. We extend an invitation for all to come and join us this Sunday at 1030 a.m. for an anointed, exciting, powerful, and uplifting worship of the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Welcome to Victory Life. Uh, my name is Jim McCann, and I'm going to be with you again today in my father's absence. Uh, he's asked me to come in and uh, do a couple of these, and I'm so excited about being with you again. Uh, last time we were here, we began to talk about the race of faith. Um, if you were with us a couple of months ago, I talked a little bit about this. But um, where we left off was I was talking about distractions in the race of faith. Hebrews chapter 12 says that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And then it says this, let us throw off anything that entangles and the sin. And you know, here's the idea is that not everything that entangles us is a sin. You know, most of the time when people think of what is going to keep me from fulfilling the call of God for my life, what is going to keep me from uh, letting my life be an example of the gospel, we most of the time think of sin. But so many times the things that have become snares to us is not necessarily sin. It's uh, things that are just hindrances. And the first couple that I brought up was unpruned activities. When our hobbies become uh, a place and uh, or become our race instead of our actual race um, that's going to keep us from uh, winning the race of faith it was sure will every time we talked about people our family and friends will think they're doing uh, us a favor by talking us out of doing something great talk us out of doing something for God and uh, thinking they're hearing from God you know but I'm gonna tell you something unpruned activities and unpruned people will keep you uh, from fulfilling the call of God where I'd like to pick up today, we're going to turn to James chapter 1 in just a moment. But today I want to talk to you about an unpruned spiritual diet will keep you from fulfilling the call of God on your life. An unpruned spiritual diet. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're an athlete, you're going to have to eat right. You know, when athletes get into their particular time of year and their season, they even get stricter on their diet. They're already strict, but they'll get even more strict. I remember when I was in high school, if we had a game that night, whether it was basketball or football or whatever, the coach would make sure that we didn't have Cokes, we didn't have sweet tea, anything that was sugar that would make us breathe heavier. He wanted us to drink water. He wanted us to drink Gatorade. He wanted us to be hydrated for that night. You know, there's just certain things that athletes are going to have to be a whole lot more disciplined in. And that's the idea of a race. If we're going to keep our eyes on the goal, we're going to keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and the what? Perfecter. We talked about that last time we were here. We're going to let Jesus perfect us today. If we're going to let him perfect us, then we're going to have to say, okay, this may not necessarily be a sin, but it has become a hindrance in my life. I can't do both. I remember one time, let me give you another good example. You know, uh, you know, some people are going to be unique in the sense that they're called a fivefold ministry. I know that's me. And I knew at a point that I could not continue being a business person. I own my own gym and doing full-time ministry, and I had to make a choice if I was going to put 100% into one of them. Now, some people, you might be at a place where you can do that. You know, praise God that if the ministry is not uh, able to provide a adequate means for you, you know, then praise God people can do something on the side. Uh, even Paul went and made tents for a season. But in my own personal life, I came to a point where I said, okay, what am I called to do? And I made that decision, and I knew that if I stayed with the gym, you know, any longer, then it could become what my race is, and that's not what I'm called to do. You know, my race is not to build my own business and to do the, it's what I'm going to do for the kingdom of God. Now, many people, you can build a secular business and use it as a means to get people saved, and I did. I've witnessed the people in the gym and things, but that's not what I was called to do. I was called to full-time ministry. I sold the business, and I went gung-ho. Uh, into full-time ministry. Praise God. I had to take a pay cut and everything. 
But you know what? I was going to be obedient to what God's called me to do. Not going to let these hindrances uh, keep me from winning my race. You know, the society we live in, I mentioned last time, we get too caught up in the hobbies. We get too caught up into pleasure. And many people, here's another major hindrance, they get into unnecessary debt. They live in homes that they, you know, can't even afford. And then so when God calls them to do something and they got, they've got they ran up their credit cards, I know people and talked with people and counseled with them who are thirty dollars and $40,000 in debt on credit cards or it takes them half their paychecks, you know, two weeks out of the month just to pay their house note. And if anything goes wrong that month, if the uh, washing machine goes out or the dryer goes out or something major goes on, they're in a tight, they're, they're, they're tight and they're in a, uh, they're in a crisis and they're believing God for a miracle. You know why? Because they're living way beyond their means. We have become a society, especially in America, that lives way beyond our means. I'm going to tell you something. When God uh, reveals to you what his purpose is for your life, and I'm going to tell you something, he will. We just got to be in tune with him. You know, when you make the Word of God and prayer your top priority, God will begin to show you things. And I'm going to tell you something. It will take time. It will take hard work. It'll take money. And if we're strapped down to a bunch of debt that just for, for pleasure, for hobbies, then it's going to distract us and keep us from fulfilling the call of God. And I'm not talking about that we can't enjoy things. I'm not talking about we can't have a nice home and a nice car. Or, or something like that. But I'm going to tell you something. There's got to be a balance. We've got to make sure that those things have not become a hindrance and will keep us from fulfilling the call of God. You know, if I'm worried about uh, paying a, a whole bunch of bills that I've got myself into, um, how am I going to go and do some of the things that God's called me to do that's going to take a lot of uh, financial uh, income to do that? So anyway, many things become a hindrance and a distraction. The one I want to talk to you about today is uh, we've talked about unpruned people, unpruned activities. Today I want to talk about an unpruned spiritual diet. We are living in a day and time where we cannot neglect the word in prayer. If somebody, if a, if a runner out there, he is not, uh, like I talked about um, earlier, you know, if he's not eating right and he's not exercising right, he is not going to be ready for his area of expertise. You know, he's not going to be ready. But you know what? We're going we're gonna to have to keep ourselves ready. I tell you what, we're living in a day and time where we need to be stronger in faith than any other time in history. Jesus said that the last days, he was uh, sp speaking through Paul, because we know that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Literally, all Scripture is God-breathed. So even though Paul wrote it down, God was speaking through Paul, and he told Timothy that in the last days, perilous times would come. The word perilous denotes that it's going to be the worst of worst times. That there's a time coming upon this world that is going to be more evil, and we're slowly seeing that come about, and it seems to be escalating in the days to come. You know, we've noticed that in the uh, last uh, several months how this ISIS thing has gotten bigger, how this Ebola in Africa has gotten bigger and even made its way into the United States. People are just terrified through terrorism and things. Well, let me tell you something. If we're not going to live in a spirit of fear, but we're going to go out and we're going to do great things for the kingdom of God, and we're going to see the gates of hell not prevail against the church, we're going to have to be people of strong, strong faith. It's faith that overcomes the world. Faith is an overcoming force. We have everything we need for life and for godliness. In other words, I've got everything I need for this life. And it's all based upon his word. But if I never go to the word of God and let it perfect me and let it build me and let it make me stronger, then I won't know and I'm going to be weak. You know, the Bible says that Satan comes about as a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. I want you to notice the Bible doesn't say that he devours everyone. It says who he may devour. And I'm going to tell you who th those are, the people who he may devour are these. The next line says this. Resist him steadfast in the faith. If you are steady and fastened, steadfast in the faith, then you're going to be able to resist the devil. The Bible says in James also, it says, Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he must flee. And I'm going to tell you what, there's going to be a time approaching, there's going to be a time coming up where, where all hell could be breaking loose around you, and you keep resisting the devil and resisting the devil, and he's not fleeing. And you say, why? Well, the first line is, submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. See, there's a twofold purpose there. you got to submit to God and then resist the devil. Well, let me ask you this. Are you submitted to God? How do you do that? By being submitted 
to his word. Now, we've been coming out of Hebrews chapter 12, where we're talking about the race of faith. But I want to speak to you real quickly about how about letting Jesus perfect us in our faith work and talk about this spiritual diet we have. The um, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 talks about how uh, God at different times and at different time periods spoke to people or literally his people, you know, namely Israel, but even before that, you know, before Israel was a nation and before it was a family, all the way back to Genesis chapter 2 really, he spoke to his people through the prophets. Well, I know there wasn't a prophet technically in chapter 2, but you, you get the idea. There was a time period where it says that he spoke to people through the prophets. And yes, I do believe in the office of prophet today, but I want you to notice the next part. Genesis, this is in Hebrews chapter 1. It says, but has in these last days, we're in the last days. I mentioned last week, we're in the last of the last days. It says, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. You know, if we lived in the Old Testament, if we wanted to hear the word of God, we had to hear it from the prophet. There was time periods where there was no prophet. Nobody was speaking for God. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3 talks about how the word of God was rare in those days. In other words, nobody was hearing from God. Nobody was being the voice of God. The, the, uh, the people of God, even the priests of God, Eli and his sons, especially his sons, had become very wicked. And people were needing someone to speak for God because that's how people heard him in the Old Testament. They would go to the prophet of God and saw what the prophet was saying. That's why it was so blasphemous but where these evil prophets would come up and they would speak for themselves or uh, speak for someone who paid them to speak, like Balaam, you know, what they uh, Balaam, tried to get Balaam to do. And of course, we know that Balaam could not curse the people of God. He could only bless them. But point being is this, they had to go to a prophet. And through different ways and different time periods, God spoke to people through prophets. But it says, nowadays, you don't need to run out to a prophet. Because I'm going to tell you something, there's a lot of still false prophets out there. And you could run out to the man of God or the woman of God and say, please give me a word, please give me a word. I need to hear from God. But I'm going to tell you something. You have the same Holy Spirit on the inside of you than the greatest, with whoever you would consider the greatest believer on this earth. And uh, I don't care who you put up on a pedestal, you have the same Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. If you have professed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, do you believe that with your heart? You are born again and you are wall to wall Holy Spirit, glory to God. And you know what? God speaks to you and it will speak to you if you just listen the same way he spoke, he speaks to anyone else. And that is through his son. Now, how does he do that? Well, yes, he can speak to our spirit. He can speak to us uh, inwardly through times of prayer and worship. And, and no doubt, I've been driving down the road before and God give me a word. But I'm going to tell you, the majority of time, God is going to speak to us through his word. We do not need to neglect any times, uh, our quiet times, where we get by ourselves. I'm not talking about going to church, and that is important. That's in Hebrews 2. That's over in chapter 10. Not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, especially in what you see the day of the Lord approaching, speaking of the last of the last days. We don't need to neglect church. We don't need to neglect being under a pastor and being under uh, a, a good teaching uh, on the Word of God. But I'm going to tell you something. Number one, you do not need to neglect every day, every day, every day being in the Word of God. We have to let this perfect us and let us show us, let us tell us who we are. You know, the world will tell you who you are. The world tells young people who they are all the time. The world will tell people, oh, you were born that way. Or this society is lazy, so therefore you're lazy. You know, uh, your mom and dad were drug addicts, so you're probably going to be a drug addict. And people grow up with the mentality of their family telling them who they are, of society telling them who they are, of their friends telling them who they are. But let me tell you something. We need to let the Word of God define who we are. Uh, I'm not going to take the time to go there. I'm going to stay with me in James chapter 1. We're going to go there in just a minute. But over in Matthew chapter 16, the Lord is having a discussion with his disciples, and he asks this, Who do men say I am? Who does men say the Son of Man is? And you know that all of his disciples began to say, Well, some say you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. You know, Some say uh, you, you're this prophet. You know, one of them, was, uh, I, I think it's kind of comical, says, Well, some say you're John the Baptist back from the dead. You know, and, and we know that one of those people obviously was Herod. 
Because when he heard about Jesus doing miracles, he says, surely this is John the Baptist back from the dead. Even though that it never records Herod doing a miracle, evidently Herod thought that uh, he could do one. But anyway, point being, everyone had their opinion on Jesus. But you know, Jesus was not moved by those things. Not for one moment did Jesus stop and think to himself, that's who I am. I'm John the Baptist back from the dead. That's who I am. I'm Jeremiah. That's who I am. Or, or Elijah. You know, I'm one of these great prophets uh, back on earth doing some type of ministry. Not for one moment. But you know there has been great men of God uh, in the last hundred years who said, I'm Elijah. I'm the Elijah to come. And they totally got off the boat and they began to believe uh, something about themselves that wasn't true. You know, the Word of God will tell you who you are and who you are not. You know, one of the most interesting things we see about Jesus and the reason that Jesus not for one moment said, that's who I am. And when finally Peter spoke up and says, no, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And of course, Jesus spoke a blessing. He said, blessed are you, Simon. He said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. Jesus knew Simon was right. He knew everybody else was wrong. Simon was right. Jesus knew what God's word said about him. And he knew it from a very early age. You know, the Bible, uh, we even see, at, for example, when he was 12 years old and they left him behind uh, in Jerusalem and they found him at the temple after three days. And what did Jesus say? Did you not know that I would be here about my what? Father's business. At 12 years old, Jesus knew he had his father's business to do. How many 12-year-olds know that they have business straight from their Heavenly Father? You know what? I have a little boy and a little girl, and I guarantee you one thing. I'm going to let them know that God has a plan for their life as they grow up. God has a purpose for them. And when they're 12 years old, they'll be able to say like Jesus, I have my Father's business to do. That's the way we should be. And as you see Jesus getting older and, and growing up, and, our, and when he comes out uh, of the wilderness filled with the Spirit, and he goes into his own hometown of Nazareth, he pulls open the scroll of Isaiah. He goes to his passage of Scripture, which is actually found in Isaiah 61, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has anointed me to bind up the brokenhearted. He has anointed me to set the captives free. And he begins to go down those passages of Scripture, and he looks at those people, and he says, Today this Scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Why could Jesus say that? Because Jesus knew it was talking about him. Jesus knew who he was because he let the, the very word of God define who he was. You know, another good example is John the Baptist. When they came to John the Baptist, they said, who are you? Are you the Messiah? He said, no. You know, a lot of people, they're going around saying, you know, a lot of false teachers all through history and some to come. You know, they'll say, well, I'm the Messiah, I'm Jesus, or I'm the Savior, I'm the great anointed one. You know, John knew who he was, and he, he knew who he was not. And they said, well, are you the Messiah? And he said, no. He said, are you Elijah? He said, no. John knew who he was. They said, then who are you? And you know what John did? Just like Jesus, he quoted Scripture. He said from Isaiah, I am the voice of one calling in the desert. Prepare the way of the Lord. He says, I'm not the Lord, I'm the one to prepare his way. I'm the voice, one crying in the wilderness. John looked in scripture and he found himself. And yes, I can take you on a little detour here, but I'm not going to have time. But I can take you on a detour that literally where John grew up, where he lived, uh, you know, in the last hundred years when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, they found a copy of the scroll of Isaiah. Guess where it was? Exactly where John was living. Oh, in that community of people who lived there they called the Essians, who probably John was around, there was a copy of the scroll of Isaiah. And I can imagine one day John pulled out that scroll and he said, that's me. I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. You know what? Everybody needs to go to the Word of God and to let the Word of God define who they are. You know, young people right now watching, you know what? You need to go over to Acts chapter 2 and say, you know what? The Bible says right here, in the last days, God will pour out His Spirit on all flesh, and part of that is that His sons and His daughters will prophesy. You know what? Every one of you watching today is a son or a daughter living in the last days. I don't care if you're 90 years old, you are a son and a daughter living in the last days. And you know what? You can go to that passage of Scripture and say, I found myself. I'm supposed to be a voice in these last days. I'm supposed to prophesy in these last days. Revelation says that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. 
You know, we talked about that a little bit last week and a couple months ago, that, you know, the gospel is our, should be our central focal point of the race we run. And so, you know what, let me ask you today, what are you doing to get ready and prepare yourself and let the Word of God perfect in your life to be a better steward of the gospel? To be a better steward of the gospel. Letting the Word of God define who you are, let it define who you are not, let it define what areas of weakness or sin, whatever that you need to extract and get out of your life. Praise God. Well, that's enough of that. Let's go to James chapter 1 and let's read some more passages concerning this, letting the Word of God perfect us. James chapter 1, and I'm going to go down. Well, we'll start with verse 21. I won't comment too much on all of it because there's just so much here. James uh, chapter 1 verse 21 says this, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive, listen to this part, with meekness the implanted word that is able to save your souls. Let's stop there just for a moment. I want you to notice it says to lay aside. And you know, once again, we talked about laying aside every weight in Hebrews chapter 12 and the sin that so easily besets us. It's the same idea. To lay aside filthiness is literally somebody who has ate too much and before they indulge in one more piece of pie, they just say, that's enough. I can't eat it no more. Or even a picture of, of someone who has come in from a work day and their clothes stink. Maybe they've been working outside and they've been hot and they're sweaty and they got cleaned up and they took a shower and they are not going to put those stinky clothes back on. You know, we need to let the Word of God clean us up and not put on the filth of the world no more. It's to lay aside, push those things aside, glory to God. Lay aside every weight in this sin that so easily besets us. But it says, therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. And listen, receive with meekness. Now, meekness is the idea of a teachable spirit. Someone who is meek is someone who is teachable. It says, receive with meekness the implanted word. Now, that's what you're doing. That's what we're talking about, a good spiritual diet. A good spiritual diet. The implanted word that is able to save our souls. You know, that's where the battle is. It's not talking about Christians being saved here when their spirit becomes born again. It's talking about our souls, our minds. In the, in the Greek thought, the soulish realm was the mind. Even the heart was in the, in, in the mind. And yes, it is a combination of the spirit and the mind. But you know, the heart can be divided. That's when your spirit goes one way, it's born again, but your mind still thinks like the world. Your mind's still thinking selfish thoughts. Your mind is filled with worry and fear uh, and, and all other kinds of things that doesn't line up with the Word of God. So what do we got to do? Literally, the whole process of this Christian walk of faith is changing the way we think. So therefore, we change the way we speak. Because it all is going to come out of this right here, the soul. You know, here's another point. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 says to Christians, not, not unbelievers, Christians to put on a helmet or the helmet of salvation. He's not telling people to get saved. Some people say that word salvation and they think, oh, he's telling them to be born again, put on the helmet of salvation. No, their minds, these are already born again. They're already born again. He's already called them brothers and talked about in, in, uh, in, in chapter 1 how they were already born again. So you know what? These people just need to get their minds caught up. We need to learn to think right. That's only going to come from the Word of God. Your soul needs a, a helmet. Your mind needs a helmet, which is the Word of God, a helmet of salvation. But then it says this, Be ye doers of the Word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself and goes away and immediately forget what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, what is that? That's this word we're reading, the perfect law of liberty, and continues. Notice there's a continuing in it. Some people, well, I, I went to church Sunday and I even go on Wednesday night. Well, what word did you hear today? The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. What are you hearing today, right now? You need to hear yourself say these things. You need to hear yourself read the Bible. It says, uh, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Now, what are we talking about? We are talking about letting the Word of God perfect us. Letting Jesus, through His Word, 
not just be the pioneer or the author, but also be the finisher or the what? The perfecter of our faith. I want you to notice right here, it says that whosoever looks into the perfect law that gives freedom is like a man who looks at himself in a mirror. But when we become a hearer of the word, like we hear in that word, we're, we're seeing ourselves in the light of God's word, but we don't do what it says. It's like that man looking at his face in the mirror and then he walks away and he forgets what he looks like. Now, could you imagine if you're walking down or let's say I'm walking down the mall or walking around somewhere and there's a mirror and I say, whoa, who's that guy? Well, people think I'm just kind of, you know, being funny or whatever because that would be ridiculous not to recognize myself in, my, on, in a mirror. I mean, wouldn't that be absolutely silly? Well, you know what? The Word of God works that way. It's a mirror. And what happens is the Word of God shows you your true potential in God. It shows you who you really are in the light of God's Word. You know, the Word of God looks at a man like Gideon. And Gideon says, man, I'm the weakest in my family. I'm the weakest in my tribe. Israel's in bondage. Let me tell you something. If you want somebody to go out, you've got the worst man for the job. That's the way Gideon saw himself. I'm the worst person you can use. But what did he see in the light of God's Word? The angel of the Lord came to him, which I believe was the pre-incarnate Christ, came to him and said, you are a mighty man of valor. A mighty man of valor. That's what the Word of God says you are. It takes David, who says, I'm just a shepherd. He says, no, you will shepherd an entire nation as a king. It takes a, a man like Peter, who says, I'm just a, a, a fisher. I'm a, I, I fish. That's what I do. That's all I've ever done is fish. And then when he sees a miraculous catch, he goes to Jesus, and his words are, depart from me. I'm a sinner. You know, I'm a sinful fisherman. How can anybody ever use me? But in the light of God's word, the Lord looked at him and says, Peter, you're a rock. Peter, I'm going to teach you how to fish for men. In other words, we've got to believe what God's word says about us. And if there's any hindrances or any distractions that don't line up with this, then you know what we got to do? We got to lay them aside. Now, I want you to notice what it says right here. It says about uh, when we look into the word of God and we're listening to it, it says, but be a doer of the word and not a hearer only, deceiving yourselves. And let me ask you this. How do we deceive ourselves? By being a doer, by, by thinking we're be, by being a hearer, that we're being a doer. Some people think by just hearing the word of God that they've done the word of God. But no, that's not what it says. It says that not only we got to hear it, we got to go out and act upon it. Jesus said it this way. It's like a man who built his house upon the rock and a man who built his house on the sand. The storm came from both houses, but only one stood. He says both of them heard the word of God, but the one who did the word of God was the house built upon the rock. If you're going to run your race today, church, if you're going to go out and do great things for God, you've got to be the one who builds your house upon the rock of not just hearing, but doing the word of God. God's got a plan for you. God's got a purpose for your life. And you know what? We would love to invite you to come out and visit with us on Sunday morning at 1030 uh, also on Wednesday nights at um, 7. And you can visit the website, bclive.org. I also want to uh, remind you about my book called The Final Lap. That is about the call of God. It's about your purpose in life. I believe it will help lead you to the, uh, to the right race, to the right way of running your kingdom race, all for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been so excited. I'm glad I got to be with, uh, be, be with you again. I want you to know that all of you out there listening are in our thoughts, they're in our prayers, we're praying for you. We just want you to know that you are blessed of the Lord. Um, I also want to remind you about Faith Sunday at the beginning of the month. Uh, and come and, uh, come and hang out with me that time, uh, sometime, all right? I'll see you then. Victory Christian Fellowship is one of the area's dynamic churches touching the lives of hundreds of people in Adamsville and the surrounding communities in the world. We're a church full of energy, faith, and most importantly, people who want to serve Jesus and one another. At Victory Christian Fellowship, we're focused on changing families that change the world by teaching people how to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Showing them from the word of God that they are champions, that God created them for greatness, and that God has a destiny for them to fulfill. VCF is a multiracial church that demonstrates God's love to all. Newcomers are extended a most cordial invitation to worship and unite with us. We're located at 2440 Minor Parkway in Adamsville. 
we extend an invitation for all to come and join us this Sunday at 10.30 a.m. for an anointed, exciting, powerful, and uplifting worship of the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 